So which part is included within the face? There is a demarcation between the scalp and face. Okay. So face is the front aspect of the head, and extend it extends in between the start the superior the hairline, elevation position of hairline, inferior the chin and base of the mandible. So from here hairline. That means forehead is also included in the face, and forehead also included within the scalp. Okay. So clearly there will be chin at the base of the mandible on each side auricles. Okay. And forehead is common for both face and the scalp. This is our stereo fiber outline of the face. Now layers of the face. Face consists of two layers, skin and superficial fascia, which containing the muscles of facial expressions. Okay, we will discuss this in details. The deep fascia is absent. This point is very very important. Deep fascia is absent in face. Also, it is absent in our abdomen. Okay. Very few areas or in our body, deep fascia is absent. Okay. Previous one. So the deep fascia is absent in face except over the parotid gland, where it forms the parotid fascia, and over the buccinator, where it forms the buccinator fascia. In this area, deep fascia is present. You have to remember. Next. So skin. What are the peculiarities of the skin of the face? Skin of the face is. Rich in vascularity, rich in sebaceous glands and sweat glands, laxity, fixity with the underlying cartilages over the layer, suspension, all these are peculiarities of skin of the face. Now, superficial fascia, it contains these structures muscles, nerves, and fat. Muscles of facial expression, nerves and vessels, and variable amount of fat. All these are lying in the superficial fascia. Next. Blasting. Blasting is rich vascularity of the face, makes the face blast and blanch with the expression and exposure to cold. Wounds. We, uh, this comes as I explain why. Why wounds of the face heal suddenly? Okay. So rich vascularity results in profuse bleeding as well as rapid bleeding, and helps in plastic surgery also. Acne or pimples, how it occurs? It occurs on the face in young adults due to clogging of hair follicles resulting in. Blockages of sebaceous glands. Okay, so this is the mechanism of acne. The edema of the face, the acidity of the face, skin cavities, the state of edema. Retinal edema first appears in the eyes and the face, and later to the other body parts. Okay, boils, boil or furrow shells in the infection of hair follicle. Boils of nose and ear is seen too. Because of fixity of skin to the underlying cartilages. Okay, these are the common clinical aspects of face. Next, okay. Now muscles of the facial expressions they are inserted into the skin of the face, and fat is absent in eyelids, where it forms a buccal kind of fat over the cheeks. Suctional kind of fat. It is buccal kind of fat, and this is prominent in infants, and helps in suckling bleed in infants. Okay. Next. Now, cleavage lines. This dotted line you can see over the face. These are the cleavage lines or lantern lines of the face. Skin. Cleavage line or lantern lines of skin. These are topological lines, and that are produced due to parallel orientation of collagen fibers in the dermis and the underlying muscle. Okay. 
and the orientation of cleavage line in the skin of face is region specific. Natural wrinkle lines result from repeated folding of skin perpendicular to the long axis of the underlying contracting muscle of facial expression. And wrinkle lines become prominent in elderly due to loss of skin elasticity. And what is the importance of these cleavage lines? Uh, to excise the lesions of skin, like different scars or pigmented patches of skin cancer, the incision lines are given according to the cleavage lines. Okay, and if it is given along the cleavage lines, it will be hidden after the surgery. During healing, there is uh, no less cosmetic harm. Okay, next. Now, muscles of facial expression. What are the peculiarities? The muscles of facial expression are subcutaneous and they insert into the skin, except the platelet mark, hence, produces various facial expression. Morphologically, they are remnant of pedicular carnosus, and biologically, the facial muscles are derived from the second pharyngeal arch. And in the inner region, the case of the subcutaneous nerve, which is nerve of second pharyngeal pouch, and they contain small motor units. What are the function limbs in facial expression? Sphincters and dilators of facial orifices, such as mouth or palpebral pieces, and also the nasal apertures. Okay. Next. So, um, Facial muscles of facial expression has been grouped in six groups. Okay, we will discuss individual group. According to the location, the muscles are grouped as follows: muscles of the scalp. Only one muscle is included in the scalp, occipital frontalis. It has four bellies. Okay, two occipital belly and two frontal bellies. Supercilia and orbicular is oculi. Okay, these two are uh, lying around the orbits. Next, see these muscles, muscles of the scalp. Here is a frontal okay, is a belly is lying on the posterior part of the scalp. Okay, now muscles around the orbit, this rounded muscle. Around the orbit, this is orbicularis oculi, okay, and another is coronator supercilia. This is nine here, here. This muscle is the coronator supercilia. Okay. Next, orbicularis oculi is important. It has three parts. You have to know this muscle can be asked in your viva. Orbicularis oculi can come at the short note. Corbicularis supercilium is a small pyramidal muscle at the medial end of eyebrow. Origin is from medial end of superciliary arch, insertion into the skin of middle part of the eyebrow. And vertical wrinkling of the forehead. These actions are important. Name of the muscle and its action. Okay. Vertical wrinkling of the forehead as an expression of frowning assists the orbicularis oculi. Orbicularis oculi, it is a broad, flat, elliptical muscle surrounds the circumference of the orbit. It has three parts orbital part, palpebral part, and lateral part. Orbital part it lies around the margin of the orbit. Palpebral part lies in the eyelid. Okay, palpebral means eyelid. And lacrimal part lies lateral and behind the lacrimal sac forms the seat for the lateral sac. What are the functions of these three parts? Force to closure of the eyelids margin. And this palpebral part closes eyelids gently in sleep or in blinking. And lacrimal part directs the lacrimal sac, facilitates the lacrimal sac. Okay, that raising drainage of the tear fluid. Next, 
now we will go to muscles around the nasal opening four of the muscles are there coxillus compressor nevi dilator nevi and depressor septi next <coughs> see here this is the compressor nevi here is the dilator nevi okay coxillus next So, procerus is a small pyramidal muscle containing the medial bones of fiber of the frontal. What is the action? It forms transverse tendons over the bridge of the nose. Expression of frowning and concentration. Okay, frowning. Frown. During frowning, there is formation of transverse tendons over the bridge of the nose. Next, we go to the then is compression layers dilator layers and depressor septi compression layers this is transverse part of the nasal is helps in compression of nasal aperture dilator layers it uh, lies over the alar part it, it is also known as alar part of the nasal is and helps in dilatation of the nose and depressor septi it helps in dilatation of anterior nasal aperture puts the nose and the nasal septum downward okay so these are the functions of three parts of the nasal is next <laughs> now muscles are uh, muscles around the lips so many muscles are present here the all these muscles will be asked Orbicular is pollis, buccinator, levator. These two are important muscles. Orbicular is pollis and buccinator can come as a sort of. Okay. Next is levator, lumbar superior is alveolar, gigantomedius major, gigantomedius minor. Levator, lumbar superior is levator anterioris, depressor anterioris, depressor lumbar inferioris, anteris. All these are around the lips. Okay. Silence, everyone. Okay. Next. And these muscles are named according to their function and according to their location. Okay. So see here. This is depressor septa, part of the nasal lip. Here is the levator lumbar superior is elevated nasal. Levator lumbar means it helps in elevation of upper lip and extending up to this angle upper bridge of the nose. Here is the gigantomedius minor, gigantomedius major, lying over this gigantomedic bone. And always remember, gigantomedius minor is inferior to the gigantomedius major. Now here we are the angle of the mouth. Here we are in the uh, levator lumbar superioris, levator anterioris. Here is the buccinator. Here is depressor lumbar inferioris, depressor anterioris, and here is transverseus. Okay. On the both side, these muscles are lying, but has been shown in one side to cut up in the other muscles. Okay. So these are the muscles lying around the oral cavity or around the lips. Next, so these are the origin insertion. You have to know the action mainly. So levator lumbar superior is alveolar nasal. You can see elevation of upper lip and dilates the nose. Levator lumbar superior is you can see lumbar superior. Levator means elevation. Okay, lumbar means lips. Superior is means upper lip. So elevation and inflation of the upper lip. This will be lip. And gigantomedius major and minor. They use the angle of the smiling. Okay, elevation smiling. Elevation of the upper lip, exposing the upper teeth. And forms the nasolabial groove or furrow. The levator anterioris, elevation of angle of the mouth, is smiling and forms the nasolabial furrow. The levator is, it is, the function 
of lower rib in drinking and expressing doubt of the state and wrinkling of the skin of the chain. Metallics when depressor, labile inferior is it is the quadrilateral muscle, it pulls the lower leg downward and little laterally and it helps in expression of irony, sorrow, melancholy and doubt. Okay. And this is also important you can be asked in your viva which expression is done by which muscle. Okay. That is also important. Next. Converging, okay, and forming a rounded globular structure, thick rounded structure. Fibers converge towards the modulus near the angle of the mouth, and near the central periphery fibers intersect. That means these middle fibers are intersecting in the modulus, and those from below cross to the upper part of orbicularis oris, and those from above cross to the lower part. And the highest maximally and lowest mandibular fibers of the buccinata continue forward to enter into corresponding leads without decussation. Okay. What is the function? It flattens the cheek against the gum, prevents accumulation of food in the vestibular mouth. It is a whistling muscle. That whistling muscle is important. Okay. Asking by one and second. Buccinator, this word in Latin, its meaning is trumpeter. Okay, it's the uh, whistling. Next is orbicularis oris. It consists of four quadrants: upper, lower, left, and right. And each consists of large parts peripheralis and small parts marginalis. First, marginalis is well developed in humans. Now, these two parts. Parts peripherally, lat lateral stem is attached to modulus, consists of extending fibers and from muscles converging at the modulus. Parts marginally, single band of muscle fibers, and that originates from modulus. What is the insertion? These fibers diverge and form a triangular muscular seat in each leaf, cross the midline, and interlace with opposite side fibers. In the midline, these fibers interlace with opposite side fibers insert at the side of vermilion and zone of leaves. This is insertion for pulse peripheralis. This is insertion for pulse marginalis. Vermilion zone means the pink area is included within the vermilion zone. Okay. So, what is the action? Pulse peripheralis helps in closes the leaves. Compresses leaves against teeth and helps in mastication. And this part marginalis is associated with speech and production of musical tones. Okay, final action. So you prepare this for as a sort of buccinator, orbicularis oris, also orbicularis oculi for eye muscle. Okay, and other muscle you have to know the name and the action. Next. Next, the muscles around the auricle, around the ear. Auric three muscles are mainly present. Auricular is anterior, auricular is posterior, auricular is superior. 
this is the seat of muscle platysma okay next see this seat of muscle lying in front of knee this is platysma and near the ear there is orbicularis muscle i will show you another picture next seat of muscle in the knee how it originates uh, this is asked in viva very frequently platysma I'll also can be given a Rossby question, platysma. Okay. Origin, upper part of fascia covering the pectoral is major and deltoid muscle. This is the origin. Upper part of the fascia covering pectoral is major and deltoid muscle. Insertion fibers run upward and medially. Anterior fibers is inserted over the base of the mandible. Posterior fibers feed on lower face and lip. This is continuous with rhizoids. Action what is related to whistling? Accumulation of food in the vestibule of heart. Okay. So remember this picture to be able to tell the signs. Next. Nerve supply of the face. It has sensory supply and motor supply. Motor supply is by this facial nerve, branches of facial nerve. The muscles of facial expression, these are supplied by the facial nerve as they are derived from second pharyngeal arch. Different arches, different nerve. Nerve of second arch is facial nerve, so it will be supplied by facial nerve. Facial nerve supplied this muscle to its five terminal branches temporal, zygomatic, buccal, marginal, mandibular, and cervical. Next. Muscles of facial expression supplied by the branches of facial nerve are temporal branch, these are the five branch, one to five. Temporal branch is supplied proximally, auricularis muscle, orbicularis ocular, and corrugator superciliar. Gigomatic branch, it will supply lower half of orbicularis ocular, buccal branch is supplied muscles of cheek and upper lip. Marginal mandibular and muscles of lower limb, cervical branch supply the platysma. Okay, next. See these are the five branches. Facial nerve, it is divided into five branches. Here is the temporal branch, this is gigomatic branch, this is bar. Here is the marginal mandibular along the margin of mandibular. And going to the neck is cervical branch. See here, cervical branch is supplied the platysma. Okay. Next, this is the clinical testing of muscles of facial nerve. Can be performed with these five levels. Properly, ask the patient to look for upward without moving his head upward. Observe for the transposting of the head. Orbital superciliary asks patient to frown, observe the vertical wrinkling between these two eyebrows. Orbicularly softly asks the patient to close the eyes tightly. Orbicularly sorry asks the patient to close the mouth tightly. And vaccinated asks the patient to blow out air forcefully, that is whistling, ask the patient for whistling. Next. Next is sensory supply of the face. That is also asked. Skin of the face is supplied by branches of trigeminal nerve, except the skin over the angle of the mandible, which is supplied by plate auricular nerve. And distribution of trigeminal nerve according to the development of the face. Upper part of the face is developed from proper and the supplied by ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. The general is thick cranial now, that's why it has been made uh, not V2 and V3 like this. Okay. Five, okay. So, and this is area supplied by the maxillary division of trigeminal now, middle one part developing from maxillary process, lower part of face developing from mandibular process, the thin colored one supplied by mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve and this part near the angle of the mandible 
near the ear and posterior part of the temple this part is supplied by great auricular nerve branches from the cervical plexus okay next so these are the nerves supplying the face the following branches of cranial nerve and cervical plexus that is supplying the face of the division in these branches Supratrochlear nerve, supraorbital nerve, lateral nerve, infraorbital, external nerve. From the maxillary region, three branches. Auricular division: auricular temporal nerve, buccal nerve, mental nerve, and branches from the cervical plexus. The anterior division of the auricular nerve: transverse anterior. Lesser occipital nerve and supraclavicular nerve. All these nerves are supplied the sensory supply to the face. Okay. See the course. This is common carotid divided into internal and external carotid. From the external carotid, facial artery is arriving. Internal is the face near the angle of the anterior to the angle of masseter. Masseter is lying here. Internal the face course is tortuous. Giving upper, lower, upper, lateral, nasal branches. Okay, and continues above near the medial angle of the eye and the angular artery. So this is the course of facial artery. Next, this is facial artery course. Schematic diagram in practice. Superior labial, inferior labial, and this is the angular artery. Okay, lateral, nasal, all of the branches of facial artery. Next. So this is beginning, termination, focus, and branches. Next, tortuosity of this prevents any pull of its valve during the movement of the mandible. Okay. Another artery is present, transverse facial artery, is a branch of superficial temporal artery. Superficial temporal vein and the maxillary vein in the parotid glands, and it exceeds the parotid gland, divides into anterior and posterior division. And join anterior division joins with the facial vein to form the common facial vein. Next, see the course. This is the facial vein arising from the anterior of the eye, going downward. Joins with the anterior division of electromandibular vein, forming common facial vein. Common facial vein is joining into internal jugular vein. Next, important. This is one clinical aspect. Comes as a sort of dangerous area of face. Very very important. It is devoid of valves and facial vein communication with the cavernous sinus through these two channels. Angular vein and supraorbital vein that communicate with the superior ophthalmic vein, which is tributary of cavernous sinus. Another is deep facial vein that communicates with pericardial venous plexus, which has communication with cavernous sinus via axillary vein. These connections are important. And facial vein raised from the facial muscles, which facilitates the spread of infection and emboli from facial vein to the cavernous sinus. That's why if an infection or emboli formation occurs in this area, 
it may be drained after the cavernous sinus. Okay, that's why this area is known as dangerous area of the face. So understood? So lower part of nose, upper lip, okay, and adjacent parts of the cheek. This part is known as dangerous area of the face. Next. Okay, lymphatic groups, upper area, middle area, lower area. Upper area is draining into preauricular or superficial parotid. Middle area into submandibular, lower area into submental group of lymph nodes. This is lymphatic drainage of this. Next. Okay, posterior most part of the scalp drains into occipital node and they lie superficial to trapezius near the origin or at the apex of posterior triangle of the neck. Okay, so these are the lymphatic drainage. Superficial parotid nodes are lying just anterior to the tragus. Posterior auricular nodes are the skin of the posterior part of temporal fossa, mastoid process, parietal region of scalp. Posterior part of auricular, posterior part of external acoustic neighbor. So this is lymphatic drainage. Next, this is de development. See the processes: spontaneous process, this is maxillary process, and this is mandibular process. This will be discussed in your embryology. This for all those processes are joining on this face. And an important clinical aspect is clear lip. Okay. If there is failure of what is cleft lip, it is a congenital split in the upper lip of one or both the sides of the center. You see the upper lip of air as a cleft. Hence, this cleft lip is commonly called air lip. Form due to failure of fusion of maxillary process in the medial laser process, part of frontal laser process, results in cleft lip. It is treated generally, surgical correction is done. Next, okay, that's all. Any queries regarding face? So, we have to know the muscles of facial expression, facial artery, facial vein. Okay, all these are important short notes. Equilibrium from both the sides, there is 5% helium left in the spirometer, which means there should be 1 liter of air in the amount of the air that is released into the spirometer. Okay, so this is how residual volume is checked. Okay, now, see there are two very important diseases, obstructive and restrictive lung disease. In clinical practices, whenever you will be dealing with any grade of patient, these are the two diseases that you will be dealing with all your life in the patient. So you must have a very clear concept about what is obstructive lung disease and what is restrictive lung disease. Okay, now, normal lung in the normal lung there are normal airways okay the airways are surrounded by lung parenchyma which consists of lung parenchyma ki thake air space hai bol alveoli and air spaces now normal lung ki hotse airways are there lung parenchyma is there in lung parenchyma airways are embedded and the lung parenchyma comprises of the air spaces and alveolar system this lung parenchyma is elastic in nature normal physiology when you inspire what happens what is happening during inspiration when you are taking when you are inhaling the air inside your system what is happening the chest wall is expanding chest is drawing the lungs outward so the airways the airways, they are normal physiological condition. The airways, they remain open by the elastic traction of the lung parenchyma, which are present around the airways. So when you inspire, normally your lungs are expanding. So the airways, they automatically, they will become wider than normal. Pressure inside will go down, air will come in. Now, what are the muscles involved in inspiration? Main muscle, diaphragm. So when diaphragm contracts, your lungs expand, the chest wall pulls the lungs outward, air goes in and then what happens during expiration? So, uh, does any muscles are involved during expiration? Exactly, it is a passive process. You are inspirating, muscles are contracting and at the end of inspiration, the diaphragm relax, the muscles relax and the lungs 
get back to its normal position and when while it is the inward pull when the lungs are pulling drawing the chest wall inward normally what is happening the airways while inspiration they were drawn outward they become wider than normal during expiration the lungs is pulling the chest wall inward and the airways they are becoming narrow and the air is going out this is normal physiology so during expiration in normal physiological limits airways they do get narrow this is normal condition but in restrictive lung diseases can you say what is happening in restrictive lung diseases whatever happen you must have very clear concept about obstructive lung diseases and restrictive lung diseases what is happening in restrictive lung diseases can anybody say don't say that fibrosis is restrictive lung disease consolidation is restrictive ki hocche to kon part ta affected hoy ki hocche air ways e ki hocche decreasing right that normal lung okay there are air ways and there is lung parenchyma surrounding the air ways you must remember in restrictive lung disease nothing happens to the air ways there are no obstructive element present in the air ways the lung parenchyma increases in substance why this may be because of the inflammatory changes this may be because of the widespread widespread interstitial inflammation this may be because of fibrotic changes fibrosis means there is excessive deposition of collagenous material there is excessive deposition of biological material anything that is getting deposited either there is inflammation or there are fibrotic changes or there are infiltrative changes any changes that is increasing the lung parenchyma overall that is causing the increase in the substance of the lung parenchyma causes restrictive lung diseases am i clear so when in an elastic tissue in an elastic lung when a lot of fibrotic materials are deposited will it become less stiff or will it become more stiff more stiff so if it has become more stiff in nature if it has become more elastic in nature when you inspire there is no problem okay velocity of the air entry into your lungs depends upon two factor first is airway caliber caliber of your airways how well functioning your airways are and second is with how much speed your lungs are able to expand these are the two factors on which the velocity of air entry into the lungs depend in restrictive lung disease there is no problem with the air entry air entry you can take with a lot of velocity you can take the air in, air inside your lungs because the airways are normal but because the lung has become more elastic in nature when you inspire when you expand with little stretch what will happen a very tight thing very elastic in nature with little expansion it will recoil back normal lung what is happening listen carefully normal lung the inward pressure with which the lung pulls the chest wall inward chest wall inward and the pressure with which the chest wall pulls the lung outward that are equal and opposite and we say functional residual capacity is achieved at equilibrium okay but in restrictive lung disease a yawning at the part restrictive lung diseases what is happening the lungs are what is happening restrictive lung diseases there is problem during inspiration or problem during expiration <laughs> there is problem during inspiration expiration if you are you are just exhaling the lungs this is the function of the air when during inspiration when you are inhaling the lung the air can go in but the lung cannot expand the chest wall is unable to pull the lung to the normal size pull the lung outward to the normal size because the lung parenchyma has increased the substance and it has become extremely elastic in nature so with little pull it goes back and if it is not able to if it is not able to contain or inhale the maximum amount of air that it is supposed to so inspiratory what is happening the lungs are functioning at smaller volume or larger volume smaller volume lungs become smaller first reason it is becoming very much elastic the inward pull the inward recoil of the lung has increased because of the increase in the lung substance the inward recoil of the lung has increased a lot so the lungs are drawing in and the lungs are operating at smaller volumes 
okay and because it has become very much elastic in nature with little expansion it will recoil back so the amount of air that is supposed to go in will be less than the normal this is what is happening in restrictive lung diseases okay so here the lungs are operating at smaller volumes so what will happen to the total lung capacity it will decrease in restrictive lung diseases all the parameters will go down total lung capacity will decrease residual volume will decrease vital capacity will decrease okay now are you clear with restrictive lung diseases so lung fibrosis lung consolidation any space occupying lesion any widespread interstitial inflammation these are all they fall under the category of restrictive lung diseases now what are obstructive lung diseases can you tell anybody what is restrictive lung diseases remember first the problem is during inspiration when you are taking the air in because the lung substance the lung parenchyma has increased in substance it is not able to expand with little expansion it is going back okay so the main problem is during inspiration now what happens what happens can you tell what happens in obstructive lung diseases on a ha ki hote <coughs> very good what are the conditions in which there are obstruction in your ear vein ki hote bronchitis or chronic bronchitis ha kano what happens in chronic bronchitis exactly excessive mucus secretion unduly mucus secretion what will happen excessive mucus secretion it occurs in chronic smokers when somebody is smoking chronically for suppose 10 12 years the smoke particle irritates your irritates the airways and they start causing excessive secretion in unduly amounts and in that process there occurs hyperplasia of the secretory gland and the metaplasia of the goblet cells which are mucus secreting cells so when excessive secretions occur ultimately they get deposited in your airways and they block the passage of the airway they block the airways they cause the airways to become more narrow another very important disease of the obstructive lung diseases what happens in emphysema right now listen carefully what happens in emphysema in emphysema smoke particles they disturb the alveoli when the alveoli are disturbed what they cause they cause chronic there is chronic stimulation or over stimulation of alveolar macrophages and neutrophils now when alveolar macrophages and neutrophils they are eating or phagocytosing this carbon particles continuously for many many years what is happening very rapidly will you spill out something you spill out some of the food particles when the alveolar macrophages and neutrophils they are chronically phagocytosing continuously for continuous periods of time they regurgitate proteolytic enzymes proteolytic proteases and some of these proteases are elastases what these elastases do they elastases ki korbe ha bol bojhe to ha elastic tissue dakhi nosto korte hobe lung parenchyma elasticity will be destroyed gradually over the time and now listen if the elasticity of the lung parenchyma is destroyed lungs will become more stiff or less stiff less stiff and it will become more compliant to pressure changes so with there will be initially in the beginning of the disease there will be no problem with the inspiration you will be able to inspire in fact a lot of air because with little pressure the lungs will over expand with little pressure changes with little stretch it will over stretch so a lot of air will go inside your lungs okay now okay what is so alveolar macrophages some of them are the elastases which are destroying the elastic tissue so when the elastic tissue is destroyed what will happen to the size of the lung it will become smaller or larger larger because the inward recoil of the lung is lost so the lungs become quite baggy in shape they become in copd x rays when you see you see very large lungs very the lungs become very large so one reason is that the elastic nature the lung parenchyma is lost which is keeping which is responsible for causing the inward pull of the lungs so that nature of the lungs is lost because of that 
one thing your lungs becomes baggy in nature now tell me if i have obstructive lung diseases will i'll be having problem during inspiration or expiration and why expiration why तो इंस्पिरेशन क्या होते हैं? हाँ, तो व्हेन इंस्पिरेशन, व्हेन दी लंग्स देयर इज नो प्रॉब्लम विद दी एक्सपेंशन ऑफ दी लंग्स, दी लंग्स आर एक्सपेंडिंग एंड इवन दी एयरवेज बिकमिंग वाइडर देन नॉर्मल, ओके, सो इनिशियली अ लॉट ऑफ एयर कम्स इन, बट देन ड्यूरिंग एक्सपिरेशन, बिकॉज़ � because the traction pull that is keeping them open, that is lost. Some of the smaller airways they completely shut down. So air trapping occurs in obstructive lung diseases. And when air trapping occurs in obstructive lung diseases, what is happening? What will happen to the residual volume? Residual volume will increase. And what will happen? What is the hallmark of this obstructive disease? How their lungs look like? Hey, how their chest looks like? Barrel shaped. Barrel shaped. Barrel shape. Okay. So why it occurs? Because every time you inspire, you are not able to expire the total amount of air. So some amount of air is getting captured in the lungs every time the person is doing expiration. Now listen, initially there will be no problem in inspiration. But if somebody is like automatically the person will distress. After a certain point, will that person be able to inspire normally? No. So what will happen to the vital capacity? Eventually, the vital capacity will decrease. So a situation in which total lung capacity increases, vital capacity decreases, and residual volume increases. What is this? Hmm? Obstructive lung disease. And total lung capacity decreases, residual volume decreases, and Vital capacity decreases. What is this? Restrictive, restrictive lung diseases. So another condition is there. I'll tell you first this and the features and then answer. Okay. There is hyperreactivity of the smooth muscles. There are eosinophilic activity is increased. Okay. Inflammatory condition is present and the disease is episodic in nature. Bronchial asthma. Bronchial asthma. It is also categorized under obstructive diseases because obviously inflammatory mediators are there, the airways become inflamed. But bronchial asthma, there are also acute episodes of bronchial asthma that takes place. So we also include it under acute. Okay. So in these pyrometric changes in the restrictive lung diseases, the entire parameters will go down. All of the parameters will go down because the lungs are operating at smaller volume. The lungs are operating at smaller volume volumes. And the lungs is less stiff or more stiff? More stiff and less compliant. But in obstructive lung diseases, the lungs will be operating in higher volume. And they are less stiff and more compliant to pressure changes. Okay. Now let's come to the expiratory flow rates. Now the maximum amount of air that you can inhale is called forced vital capacity and all those things. What is vital capacity? Tell anybody. No. Vital capacity. Uh, you must uh, learn it by what is the actual. Don't learn it by the you know values that TV plus this you forget. Maximum amount of air that you can inhale and the maximum amount of air that you can exhale. That is vital capacity. So what can be forced vital capacity? When you are exhaling the air or throwing the air out in this pyrometric tube, what is forced vital capacity? You are exhaling it with maximum effort. As hard, as fast, as rapidly you can. That is called forced vital capacity. Now suppose the total lung capacity of a person is 6 liter. What, what can be the vital capacity of this person? Total lung capacity is 6 liter. In a normal person with a physiological range, if the total lung capacity is 6 liter, what will be the forced vital capacity? Or the vital capacity? 5 liter. 1 liter you cannot get out of your lung because that is the residual volume. So 5 liter. Now when you are exhaling the air out in this pyrometer very rapidly, initially, if you are exhaling out it very rapidly, 
initially the velocity and the amount of air that has come out of your lungs will be more and gradually because the air concentration has reduced in amount literally it will be less the volume will go less so in normal condition 80% of the air comes out of your lungs in the first second and this is known as force expiratory volume fev where which is one force expiratory volume in one second okay the remaining one liter will come out in the next two three seconds so if total lung capacity is 6 liter you can say total lung capacity is 6 liter force vital capacity is 5 liter and fev1 is 4 liter so what is this fev1 by fvc ratio coming out to be fev1 4 by 5 kato hote 0.880% when this value when this ratio goes beyond 70% significant not significant obstruction is present when fev1 by fvc ratio goes below 70% we say that some obstructive condition is present in the lungs of that person okay now in restrictive lung diseases suppose you look very blank yes yes you are uh, listening to what i am saying now listen if in restrictive lung diseases the total lung capacity from 6 liter has gone to 5 liter okay the force vital capacity will be suppose it's 4 liter fev1 is 3 liter 3 by 4 how much it is occurring koto 75% so now listen restrictive lung disease the total lung capacity has increased total lung capacity from 6 liter it has become to 5 liter okay now you are a from 6 liter it has become to 5 liter force vital capacity has become 4 liter and fev1 is 3 liter 3 by 4 75 it is still normal why it is not 70% or below 70% it is 75% ki total lung capacity ta kome gechilo but ratio ta to ek thakche ratio ta to 70% er beshi thakche to etar mane ki bol devasita when the ratio is more than 70% even in restrictive lung disease what does it indicate restrictive lung disease can no restrictive lung volume ta total kome gache but kono change hoyni because there are no obstruction present in the airways because there are no obstruction present in the airways so what i am trying to say that even in restrictive lung disease total lung capacity has reduced residual volume has reduced force vital capacity has reduced but the fev1 by fvc ratio there is no significant change even the expiration will be better because the inward pull of the lung is so much that during expiration when the lungs will require inside the airways it will put extra pressure on the airways but they are not collapsing and the air with rapidly will go outside of the lungs okay so in restrictive lung diseases fev1 by fvc ratio is not significantly changed this is what i am trying to explain now in obstructive lung diseases what will happen the total lung capacity will increase suppose the residual volume has become 3 liter residual volume has become 3 liter total lung capacity is 7 liter 3 liter is the residual uh, residual volume so force vital capacity will be 4 liter and suppose fev1 is 2 liter so fev1 by fvc ratio is 0.550% so there is significant obstruction present here the obstruction is present in the airways this is the purpose of this expiratory slow rates okay so normal now one thing in normal lung when somebody gives you a total lung capacity 6 liter force vital capacity 5 liter then if you give one 4 by 5 and then restrictive lung disease total lung capacity is reduced and you are doing 3 by 4 you might think that some if comparison is given between a normal lung and restrictive lung without saying by seeing the values you might feel that some obstruction is present but you always have to compare the amount of air that is gone out in first second with the total amount of air that has thrown out that's been thrown out of your lungs okay okay now obstructive lung disease is will be 50% now flow volume loop do you people know anything about the oh acha what is peak expiratory flow rate peak expiratory flow rate 
Anybody? Peak expiratory flow rate. Kotota hand. Speed against volume. ठीक है जी? Kotota speed है तो ये एक तक है. You are throwing it outside of your lungs. That is peak expiratory flow rate. Okay. Now can anybody explain this? Some extra things I have done here, but this is on a slow volume loop. Okay. What is this slow volume loop? Loop the key. Ita. What is this loop? Slow volume loop. When can everybody see this? Jeta aka chhe normal jeta. When you are, acha upore. Just see what I have written. If this is expiration and this is inspiration, after you have done the maximum total lung capacity six liter. After you have done the maximum inhalation. After you have done the maximum inhalation, when you are exhaling out, there will be a point when you are reaching the peak expiration flow rate. When you are so, this is that. This is the loop that is showing that. How you are exhaling out the air from your lungs. Upore ache expiration. First, you have inhaled it. <coughs> inhaled it initially at one liter. No air will go in because that's the residual volume. And here, here, little slowly, slowly your lungs are going down. Means your lungs are expanding. Your lungs are gradually expanding as you are taking the air more inside of your lung. And at zero, uh, at six liter, when maximum inspiration can you see. At six liter, when the maximum inspiration is done, your lungs cannot expand anymore. एक अंडर लिखी दिल्ली का तो लिखी ना मत करें हम जब लिखे थे. Here you are starting the inhalation. Okay, at one liter, no air will going because that is residual volume. Gradually the curve is going down because your lungs are expanding. Your lungs are expanding and here when total lung capacity has been reached, your lungs cannot expand anymore. Okay, so inspiration will stop there. And gradually, in a normal lung, when you have exhaled the maximum air, then you are throwing out the air. Peak velocity will reach, and gradually the slope comes down. And after one liter, it cannot go more because all the air has been gone out. Residual volume is there. Now, if there is any kind of obstruction in your extra pulmonary airways, if there are any kind of tracheal obstruction, what will happen to this this loop? Will it become this normal? it will not become because when you are inspiring there is certain obstruction present so you are not able to inhale it with maximum effort and gradually this loop will be less the downward whenever there is any problem during inspiration the downward curve will decrease that also i mean uh -huh. the downward intensity will increase uh, decrease because your lungs are having difficulty in expanding Your lungs are having difficulty in expanding, and of course, when you are exhaling it, the upward slope will decrease. हाँ, दो तो ये ना check your obstruction है हमें. तो निश्चय नहीं तो तो extra problem है. Large years में तो जब हम तो problem आता है, तो निश्चय तो नहीं तो तो problem होता है, ठीक है चल? और निश्चय तो छाती हो तो problem होता है. Now, what will happen in restrictive lung disease? It will inspiration will not start from one liter. It will be from the negative side of the slope. Half liter तक बहुत शुरू होते हैं. Half liter तक शुरू होते हैं. नीचे slope तक ही होगा. नीचे कत नीचे नाम कम नाम लिटरिंग एक्सपेंशन कम डाउनवर्ड स्लोप कम हो डाउनवर्ड स्लोप इंडिकेट दि रेट एंड स्पीड एट विच योर लंग्स आर एक्सपेंडिंग एंड एक्यूमुलेटिंग मोर एयर इन साइड योर लंग्स सो दैट एक्सपेंशन इज ग्रेजुअली गेटिंग रिड्यूस्ड इन रेस्ट्रिक्टिव लंग डिजीज सो दि डाउनवर्ड स्लोप विल बी लेस द डाउनवर्ड स्लोप विल बी डिक्रीज्ड एंड विल दिस स्लोप कंटिन्यू टिल 6 लीटर इट विल एंड नियरली एट 3 लीटर बिकॉज़ Total lung capacity is achieved at smaller volume because the lungs are functioning at smaller rate. The lungs are operating at smaller volume. Now, peak expiratory flow rate ta kiyo? Peak expiratory flow rate ta ato dashbe na ki onik niche obdiyashbe. Niche obdiyashbe. Kano niche obdiyashbe? 
again because the lungs are operating at smaller volume so you cannot throw the uh, air out with that high velocity as it is capable as a normal person with normal functioning lung is capable of doing ठीक है सर so peak expiratory flow rate will also be reduced in size now what will happen in obstructive lung disease okay should i try one Velocity is a 
Disease, what will a lot of you people have understood? Can anybody tell what will happen in restrictive lung disease and what will happen? Brief, I am not saying give a lecture, give an entire class on this. You people sitting in the back, can you tell what is happening in restrictive lung disease? In restrictive lung disease, just tell me problem will be during inspiration or problem will be during expiration. Problem will be in inspiration or problem will be during expiration in restrictive lung disease. Inspiration, why? Because the, I am repeating it again in restrictive set. In restrictive lung diseases, the lung parenchyma has increased in substance. So it has becoming more rigid. It is becoming more stiffened and it is becoming less compliant with pressure changes. More stiffened and less compliant with pressure changes. So with little stretch, it is not going to get more stretch to the normal lung. It is going to recoil back. And while it is going to recoil back, the pressure and the force with which it is constricting the airways, the pressure will be so much that initially the air will come out with rapid velocity. This is what is happening in restrictive lung diseases. Am I clear? Now what is happening in obstructive lung diseases? Elasticity is lost. So there is decreased resistance initially to the air entry. But there is increased resistance to air outflow. At the time of expiration, the restriction and the resistance to the airways is more. 
and ultimately the air will keep getting trapped 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 and ultimately the patient will reach a point where both the inspiration and expiration both will be problematic clear so okay now these are the obstructive and the restrictive lung diseases anything any other can you name some other diseases that will cause problem in your inspiration and expiration and will reduce acha can you tell me any condition pathological condition in which the vital capacity of the lungs increase are there any pathological condition in which the vital capacity of the lung increases there are no pathological condition of the lungs in which the vital capacity increases vital capacity decreases in every situation in every pathological condition this is the first thing that you must remember in all pathological condition vital capacity will reduce okay now any other if there are any skeletal there are four it your inspiration and expiration and vital capacity obstruction the operate at four level first of all you have to remember your higher center central nervous system which nerve supplies the diaphragm phrenic nerve root value मस्क्यूलरिंगसाइटिस the antibodies are produced against your muscles if the muscles if antibodies produced are attacking your own muscles and ultimately when it attack your respiratory muscle will you be able to contract the muscle and do inspiration expiration no then another hmm yes now this is not myasthenia gravis myasthenia gravis is different this is myositis okay and uh, skeletal deformity can you name any skeletal deformity in which if your chest wall is only deformed scoliosis kyphosis okay of course there will be difficulty in breathing uh, okay so say, nervous system problem muscular system problem skeletal deformity and pleural effusion or lung problem hoye gelo pleural effusion if there is you know fluid accumulated in the uh, in your pleural cavity if there is any kind of stab injury if there is air entry in the pleural spaces then again the uh, equilibrium at which frc will be disturbed so all this thing will occur okay kidney in latin renal what is synonymous to the kidney and nephros it uh, means kidney in greek okay so kidneys are so these are the two kidneys kidneys are two bean shaped reddish brown organs within the abdomen situated on the posterior abdominal wall and they are the major excretory organs remove the waste product of protein metabolism for our survival okay so these are the uh, uh, where is the location of kidney the kidneys lie on the posterior abdominal wall see these are the location these are these lines divide the abdomen in nine quadrant okay so uh, one on each side of the vertebral column behind the peritoneum the kidneys are nine opposite we are thoracic and upper three lumbar vertebra t2 r2 l3 vertebra this is the vertebral level and they occupy the epigastric you can see here or epigastric hypochondrite lumbar and umbilical region both the kidneys okay the right kidney lies at a slightly lower level than the left one due to the presence of liver on the right side okay so right one is slightly lower you have to remember a hey, silence everyone they are long axis are slightly oblique that is being directed downward and laterally that means upper fold is nearer to the vertebral column and lower fold is away from the vertebral column so you can see upper fold is almost 2.5 cm away from vertebral column near the hilum it is 5 cm away 
and near the lower pole it is 7.5 cm away from the vertebral column okay understood ये कथा बोल चुके कंटिन्यूअसली कथा बोले ही रहते हैं ये सामने ये आए तो तो क्यों बोल चुके तो क्या तो क्या सामने ये आए तूल नहीं है सामने ये आए वो इखाने बोल चुके बोली नहीं इखाने सामने ये आए So both kidneys, the long axis of the kidney is slightly oblique, being directed downward and laterally, so that their upper ends and poles are nearer to each other than the lower poles. Both kidneys move downward in vertical direction and for 2.5 cm during respiration. They move almost 2.5 cm. Transpyloric plane passes through the upper part of the hilum of right kidney and through the lower part of hilum of the left kidney because right kidney is lower in position than the left kidney. Now shape and measurements. Shape is being separate, you can see. Measurements length is about 11 cm. Here, yeah, this is 11 cm from upper to lower pole. Left kidney is slightly longer and narrower and width is about 6 cm, this is the width 6 cm, thickness is 3 cm, that is anteroposteriorly it is 3 cm and weight is about 150 gram in males and 135 gram in females, weight is R0 Y bar sometimes, okay. So kidneys, each kidney presents these following features. Two poles, superior and inferior pole, that is upper and lower pole. Two surfaces, anterior and posterior surface. Two borders, medial and lateral border and a hilum. So these are the presenting parts. If you are asked what are the presenting parts of a kidney, you have to tell all these. Okay. So now we will discuss individual parts. First the poles. Superior or upper pole, it is thick and round, lies nearer to the median plane than the inferior pole, it is related to the suprarenal gland. Inferior or lower pole is thin, pointed and lies 2.5 cm above the iliac crest. Okay, so these are the two poles. Next we go to the surfaces, anterior surface and posterior surface. How will you differentiate? Anterior surface is convex, faces anterolateral. Posterior surface is flat and faces posteromedially. Okay, see so direction is important to hold the kidneys in anatomical position. So hilum will be directed slightly forward to place the anterior surface anterolaterally and posterior surface posteromedially. However, in practice, it is difficult to recognize anterior and posterior surfaces and this is however easily done by seeing the relationship of structure present in the hilum. Okay? Relationship of structure in the hilum is vein, artery and ureter. The ureter will be most posterior and you place it like this that ureter is not king. Okay, understood? Next we go to the borders. It has a medial border and one lateral border. Medial border is convex above and below near the pole and concave in the middle here. It slopes downward and laterally and presents a vertical fissure in its middle part called the hilum or hilar which has anterior and posterior leads. Lateral border is convex. This is lateral border. Next is the hilum. Hilum, the medial border, central part, central part of the medial border of the kidney presents a deep vertical slit called the hilum and it transmits this following structure from anterior to posterior, VAU, 
renal vein, renal artery, and renal pelvis or pelvis of the ureter. Okay, these are the structures passing through the hilum from anterior to posterior. Here you can see vein, then artery, then ureter. Okay, here also this is a cross section, cross section through the kidney, vein, artery, and then ureter. Okay. Now the relations. Relations are important. Asked in by one. Anterior surface of right kidney. On the right and left side, the relations are different. Okay. So anterior surface of right kidney. Here lies the right suprarenal gland, right lobe of the liver, second part of duodenum, hepatic or right colic flexor, and jejunum. Liver and jejunum are separated from the kidney by peritoneum. Okay, that means these two areas are peritoneal area and rest of the surface is non-peritoneal. Next, anterior surface of left kidney. It is related to these structures: left suprarenal gland, spleen, stomach, pancreas, and splenic vessels. Left colic flexor, jejunum. Stomach, spleen and jejunum are separated from the kidney by the peritoneum and rest is non-peritoneum. Okay, understood? See, these are the different areas. Here is right kidney. This is suprarenal area, hepatic area, duodenal area, colic area and this is jejunal area. And for the left kidney, this is suprarenal area, gastric area, pancreatic area, jejunal area, colic area and this is Plenic area. Okay, to so practice this diagram, the anterior relation of the kidney. Next, go to the posterior relation. On the posterior, on both sides, same structures are present. Posterior relations of two kidneys are the same, except that right kidney is related to one rib, while left kidney is related to two ribs. Okay, left kidney is higher, that's why two ribs are coming in contact. So, four muscles are present, those which were present in the posterior abdominal wall, diaphragm, quadratus lumborum, psoas major and transversus abdomini. These are the four muscles, three nerves are present, all these are present in the posterior abdominal wall, subcostal nerve, root value is T12, iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal nerve, root value L1. The subcostal nerve is accompanied by the subcostal vessel. Okay. One or two ribs, the right kidney is related to the 12th rib, whereas the left kidney is related to the 11th and 12th rib. Okay. See, this is the posterior relation. Right kidney is related to 12th rib and left kidney 11th and 12th rib. This is the attachment of diaphragm. Median arcuate ligament, lateral arcuate ligament. Okay, this is psoas quadratus lumborum. Here is the psoas major, and here is transversus abdominis muscles are related. These are the three nerves: subcostal nerve, iliohypogastric, ilioinguinal. Along with subcostal nerve, subcostal vessels are present. The, on this side also the same: psoas major, quadratus lumborum, transversus abdominis, subcostal nerve with the vessel. Iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal nerves. These are the posterior relations of the kidney. Now, capsules. Capsules are important. From in, inside outward, kidney is surrounded by four capsules or coverings. First is the fibrous capsule or true capsule. Okay, this is kidney. This is a longitudinal section through the kidney. So, this violet colored one is representing the kidney. Outside it, the black line is the fibrous capsule or true capsule formed by condensation of the parenchyma of the kidney. Outside it is the perirenal or perinephric fat. This yellow area with some dots, this is perinephric fat. Then there is renal fossa or false capsule. This green one is the renal fossa or fossa of gerota or false capsule. Okay. Reflection of this renal fossa is asked in your viva. Pararenal then or paranephric. This is perinephric fat outside the kidney. And outside the renal fossa will be the paranephric fat or pararenal fat. 
This is very very important. It is lying only on the posterior surface. Location is important. Okay, and it separates the kidney from the posterior abdominal wall. Understood? And see here, this renal fossa. It is fuses with. It has two layers: anterior layer and posterior layer. These two layers are continuous downward and enters into the pelvis. And above these two layers fuses above the upper wall of the kidney. Okay, then it again separate and enclose the suprarenal gland in a separate compartment and extends upward to be attached with the diaphragm. Okay, understood? This is reflection, longitudinal reflection of the renal fossa. So fibrous capsule, it is a thin membrane. So we'll discuss individual layers now. So first is fibrous capsule or true capsule. It is a thin membrane which closely envelops the kidney, formed by the condensation of fibrous connective tissue in the peripheral part of the organ. And the capsule passes through the hilum to line the renal sinus and becomes continuous with the walls of calyces where they are attached with the kidney. Next is perirenal or perinephric fat. It is a layer of adipose tissue surrounding the fibrous capsule of kidney. This fatty capsule is thickest at the borders of the kidney. It belongs through the hilum into the renal sinus. And in chronic debilitating diseases, the depletion of perinephric fat can and <coughs> depletion of perinephric fat occur towards the lower pole of the kidney, and it fills the paravertebral gutter. And forms a cushion for the kidney. Okay. Now, renal fossa or false capsule, fossa of Gerota. It is the fibroalveolar sieve which surrounds the kidney and perirenal fat. It consists of two layers: an ill-defined anterior layer, also known as fossa of Tone, and a well-defined posterior layer, fossa of Bucher Candle. So, what are the extent? Uh, superiorly, these two layers first enclose the suprarenal gland in a separate compartment, and then fuse with each other, and becomes continuous with the diaphragmatic fossa. <coughs> Inferiorly, the two layers remain separate and enclose the ureter. Anterior layer is gradually lost in the extraperitoneal tissue of iliac fossa. While posterior layer blends with the fossa iliaca. Okay. Laterally, the two layers unite firmly and becomes continuous with the fossa transversal lateral reflection. And medially, the anterior layer passes in front of the kidney and the renal vessels, merges with the connective tissue surrounding the aorta and the inferior vena cava. And the posterior layer passes behind the kidney. And it is attached to the fossa covering the quadratus lumborum and soas major. Okay, so these are the reflection: anterior, posterior, medial, and lateral reflection. Okay, superior, inferior. We have seen in the picture and medial lateral. See, this is superior and inferior reflection. Here is the medial and lateral reflection. Laterally, two layers are fused and then continues as the The fossa transversal fuses with the fossa transversal, and medially anterior layer passes in front of this aorta, and IVC fuses with the layer of the opposite side, and posteriorly it is fuses with the fossa covering quadratus lumborum and soas major. Here, okay, understood. So this is transverse, this is medial and lateral reflection. And superiorly, it is attached with the diaphragmatic fossa. Inferiorly, this posterior layer is attached with the fossa iliaca. Anterior layer is uh, lost in the pelvis. Next is paranephric fat or pararenal fat. It is a layer of fat lying outside the renal fossa, and it consists of considerable quantity of fat being more abundant posteriorly and towards the lower pole of the kidney. This is important position, more abundant posteriorly and towards the lower pole. It fills the paravertebral gutter and forms a cushion for the kidney. Now we go to the interior of the kidney. 
when the kidney is split longitudinally it presents the kidney proper and the renal sinus so this part is the kidney proper and this tree like branching pattern this is this part is the renal sinus renal sinus is a area which contains the renal pelvis and the renal vessels lymphatics etc okay so first we will discuss the kidney proper the naked eye examination of kidney proper presents a outer cortex inner medulla this part this thin area is the outer cortex and these are the pyramids pyramids are included within the renal medulla cortex is located just below the renal capsule outer covering is a two capsule or fibrous capsule so cortex is located just below the capsule and extends between the renal pyramids as renal column see in between the pyramids this cortex is entering inside that is known as renal columns of bartini okay columns of bartini and the cortex appears pale yellow with granular texture the medulla is composed of 5 to 11 dark conical masses called the renal pyramids pyramids of malpighi so these are the renal pyramids apices of the renal pyramids form nipple like projections that is known as the renal papilla which in vagina is the minor calyces see base is directed towards the cortex apex is directed towards the calyces okay mind towards the minor calyces forming the renal papilla next renal sinus so outer part is cortex inner here is the medulla and this uh, area this area is known as renal sinus what is renal sinus it is a cavity of considerable size present within the kidney it takes up a large part of the interior of the kidney and opens at the medial border of the kidney as the hilus it what what is the contents of this renal sinus this is important ask in your viva greater part of renal pelvis major and minor calyces renal vessels lymphatics and nerves and fat and the renal sinus is lined by the continuation of two capsule of the kidney okay see here this is the capsule it is continuing to line the renal sinus numerous nipple like elevations or renal papilla indent the wall of the sinus okay near the minor calyces and the renal pelvis within the sinus is divided into two or three large branches called the major calyces and which further divides to form five to 11 short branches called minor calyces see here these are two major calyces they are dividing into minor calyces okay now arterial supply kidney arterial supply has been discussed in detail in your lecture okay so shortly we will discuss here kidney the arterial supply is very very important comes as a long question okay so kidney is supplied by renal arteries usually there is one renal artery for each kidney and arise directly from the abdominal aorta so these are the renal arteries about 30% individuals accessory renal arteries are also formed renal artery divides into anterior and posterior divisions you can see here the division anterior for the four segments and posterior is for the posterior segment of the kidney so anterior division supplies the apical upper middle and lower segments and posterior division supplies only the posterior segment of the kidney and the branches supplying the segments are called the segmental arteries segmental this lower artery is the segmental artery then segmental artery is divides into inter lower arteries passing between the pyramids within the renal columns and then they are dividing into uh, arcuate arteries from the arcuate artery these arteries are inter lobular arteries okay and from where the afferent artery also arises 
and forming the glomerular capillary plexus from the referent arterioles then peritubular capillary plexus okay so this is the division abdominal aorta giving renal arteries segmental arteries interlobar then arcuate then interlobular so 5 to 8 capillaries vascular segments has been discussed these are the five segments apical upper middle lower and posterior okay you have seen this venous drainage the venous blood from the kidneys is drained by the renal veins right and left renal veins lymphatic drainage the lymphatic from the kidney drain into the paraortic lymph nodes at the level of origin of the renal artery l2 level lymphatic drainage nerve supply each kidney is supplied by the renal plexus of nerves which reach the kidney along the renal artery and the renal plexus consists of both the sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers sympathetic fibers are derived from p10 to l1 spinal segment parasympathetic fibers are derived from both vagus nerve okay so these are the nerve supply of the kidney next we go to the clinical aspect first one is floating kidney or hypermobility of the kidney kidney is kept in position by the perirenal fat and renal fossa however each kidney moves up and down with respiration movement is about 2.5 cm you have learned and if the amount of perinephric fat is reduced mobility of kidney becomes excessive that is known as floating kidney and may reduce the symptoms of renal colic caused by kinking of the ureter a floating kidney can move up and down but not from side to side within the renal fossa you have seen the reflection of the fossa so it cannot move from side to side up and down movement can occur now renal trauma kidneys are well protected by the lower ribs lumbar muscles and vertebral column still a severe blunt injury of the abdomen can may crush the kidney against the last 11th or 12th ribs and the vertebral column and the penetrating injuries are usually caused by stab or gunshot wound since about 25% of cardiac output passes through the kidneys severe renal injury can lead to rapid blood loss and blood from the ruptured kidney or pus in a perirenal abscess first descends the renal fossa then trickles downward within the fossal compartment and may reach the pelvis okay so this is the um, direction of pus pus flowing up to the pelvis from the kidney next is transplantation of kidney very frequently done nowadays it is done in chronic renal failure in selected cases donor kidney is placed rectoperitoneally in the iliac fossa it is not placed in the posterior abdominal wall high up like normal position it is placed rectoperitoneally in the iliac fossa with hilum parallel to the external iliac vessel renal artery is anastomosed end to end to the internal iliac artery and renal vein is anastomosed end to side to the external iliac vein and the ureter is implanted into the urinary bladder ureterocystostomy is done microscopically the kidneys are consist of nephrons okay functional unit of nerve is alveolus lymph for liver it is a uh, lobule and the functional unit of kidney is nephron and smaller number of collecting tubules and each kidney has about 18 lobes and 1 million nephrons okay nephrons you have learned during your 12th okay, so no need to discuss nephron can come as a long question different description different part bowel and capsule glomerular its different lining in histology you have read also pct loop of finally dct all those will be asked collecting tubules their lining epithelium what are their functions like this okay 
So all this has been discussed. So this is afferent, afferent arterial. It is forming glomerular plexus. Then from there, efferent arterial is arising, forming the peritubular plexus. Peritubular uh, capillaries they join to form the venules. Venules are draining into this uh, vein. Okay, and uh, this is around the glomerulus. This is Bowman capsule, prosthesis, lupofenly, DCT, and here is the collecting duct. Okay, and see here this afferent arteriole. This uh, glomerulus and the part of the DCT, they are together forming the juxta glomerular apparatus. Okay, that is also comes as a short term. Juxta glomerular apparatus. The two types of nephrons are present: cortical nephrons with short loop of Henle. This is one cortical nephron, and juxta medullary nephrons with long loop of Henle, like this. Differential glomerular, all these we have learned, and this is also important. Histology of filtrates and membrane. It consists of three layers. Okay, endothelium of the glomerular, single layer of capillary endothelium with penetration. It prevents RBC passage and passage of WBC. This is the endothelium. Basement membrane. This one is the basement membrane. Between endothelium and visceral layer of glomerular capsule prevents passage of large protein molecules and filtration sleeves in podocytes. See, these are the podocytes. In between these uh, foot pads of podocyte, there lies the filtration sleeve. Podocytes specialize epithelium of visceral layer of the Bowman's capsule, foot like extensions with filtration sleeves between the Extensions restricts passage of medium size protein. Okay, so the filtrate then diffuses across the Bowman space into the tubules of the nephron. In the tubules, some substances are added to the filtrate as part of the urine formation, and some substances are absorbed out of the filtrate and back into the blood. That's the urine formation occurs within the nephron. Okay. Okay. Juxta glomerular apparatus. The distal end of the renal tubule passes next to the glomerulus to form the juxta glomerular apparatus. Juxta means next to glomerulus. Okay. So juxta glomerular apparatus consists of cells located in and around the glomerulus and the glomerular capsule. So it consists of two types of cells mainly: juxta glomerular cells and macular dendro cells. Juxta glomerular cells secretes the hormone renin, and macular dendro cells it is sensitive to the concentration of NaCl. Okay, this is lining the afferent arterial macular dendro, and also there is lattice cells, lattice cells, and mesenchymal cells lying in between the capillaries of the glomerulus. Okay, so these three types of cells are together forming the juxta glomerular apparatus. Very important sort of. Now these are the functions of kidney. Okay, this is asked in your viva if kidney is asked in viscera. Urine formation, excretion of waste product, regulation of electrolytes, regulation of acid base balance, control of water balance. Control of blood pressure, renal clearance, regulation of RBC production, erythropoietin is secreted by the kidney, helps in regulation of RBC production, and synthesis of vitamin D to its active form. Some enzyme of the kidney is involved in activation of vitamin D, and secretion also of prostaglandin. All these are done by the kidney. So functions of kidney can also come as a part of long session. Or asked in your viva. Okay, so understood. So how will you hold the kidney in anatomical position? We have to first see the hilum of the kidney. Okay, hilum will have three structures. 
renal vein renal artery and the pelvis of the ureter ureter you have to place posteriorly that's how differentiate anterior and posterior okay and this uh, border the border containing the hilum that you have to place medially so medial lateral is confirmed and you have to check whether the ureter is kinked or not if it is kinked it is a wrong sign okay you have to uh, place it like this that ureter is not kinked that's how you differentiate upper pole and lower pole so you have to place upper pole more medially okay than the lower pole and the hilum of the kidney more anteriorly than the lateral border so medial border will be more anteriorly placed than the lateral border that's how you hold the kidney in anatomical position understood anterior posterior differentiated by ureter will be posterior upper and lower pole ureter should not be kinked okay and uh, and uh, medial and lateral hilum will be placed medially okay that's how you differentiate whether it is a right kidney and left kidney okay and in a cart section you have to see the cortex and the medulla within the medulla you have to see the pyramid and within the renal sinus if it can be visible major and minor calices you have to see okay and in between the pyramids renal columns of bartini can be seen okay and outer covering is the capsule or fibrous capsule of the kidney so all these you have to see okay